Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Carolina Conversation. Uh, I'm your host, Shimon Williams, and we have one of the greatest Carolina basketball players, if not the greatest, with us today. Uh, this man transformed Carolina basketball. He was the first of the first, and I think it's more importantly to know that everybody that you like, uh, all these kids that you like today, uh, none of this will be uh, capable uh, without this man. Uh, he came to the University of North Carolina in 1967. He was the first African-American basketball player at the University of North Carolina. Um, he hails from Bedford Stuyvesant, New York. Uh, he was uh, also an Olympic medalist. Uh, we have none other than the, the most important man in Carolina basketball, the Charlie Scott. Welcome, Mr. Okay, Scott, to the thank show. Thank you, uh, Shimon. Uh, first of all, I'm not from Bedford Stuyvesant, I'm from Harlem. I went to Stuyvesant High School. Okay. I, also, okay. Yeah, I, Bedford Stuyvesant, that's Brooklyn. I would never go in Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, well, I know yeah. you. I'm from Stuyvesant High School. So I, thought, I went to Stuyvesant yeah, High School. Yeah, well, good. Stuyvesant is in Manhattan. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm from Harlem as well. 129th and 8th, St. Nick Project. I'm from 131st. I used to hang out in the St. Nick Projects. <laughs> We ran college and Bob right Samuels up. and all of them. Yeah, and that's where the first yes, one was, was really at the St. Nicholas Project. That's where Rucker first started. Same thing with the project. project. So, yeah, I mean, yes, that's my area also. I went to PSO 68, you know. Yeah, and PSO, <laughs> yeah so I mean, we're yeah. from the same area. That's the same area. Yeah, well, I yeah, mean, yeah. Back to it, you my know, family. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I like the introduction, but you know, uh, like I said before, before we got online, you know, everything I, I was able to accomplish was done with the assistance of a lot of other people who were, who were behind me, people who really stood behind me when, when, when I really needed help, you know. Uh, I didn't have much of a family background, so really the Carolina people have been always the people of my family background, people like Coach Lodge, uh, uh, Albert Long, who just passed uh, the leads. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, yes. the lead. Uh, I mean, and then a, another person was uh, Ed and Eva Caldwell. I mean, these people had a lot to do with me being able to sustain the circumstances that I had to relate to at the University of North Carolina. And of course, you know, Coach Smith, who's my mentor and who is really the person that I try to please every day of my life when I when no I wake up because he's the person that really. Uh, me to become the person that I've become. And also he was the person that taught me how to be the type of individual that uh, I hope all Carolina players are like. Yes, sir. Yes, Can sir. All in? Yes, sir. <laughs> all right. Yeah, you got it all. Boy, if they could have got what we were talking about before, man. But more importantly, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Scott, um, you know, in, in, when you made the decision to come to the University of North Carolina, you know, no. How how did that all play out? I mean, because there was no one at the University of North Carolina that looked like you. Uh, you know, there there were great basketball players, but you know, you were extremely talented, and and just being you know that first individual. What what went through your mind and to to help you make that decision to say, hey, you know what, I'm I'm gonna be that guy. I'm gonna be that guy. I'm gonna put it all on my shoulders. I'm gonna be that guy. You know, that's a lot of heroism so you want in that. Real answer of what went through my mind to make me go to Carolina. Well, well I, I uh, would like to get both. Okay, no, I'm gonna give you the answer. Okay, see, uh, uh, first of all, you know, I went to school at Lomberg Institute, which was in North Carolina at that time. Yes, sir. So I was very familiar with, you know, you know, the North Carolina Duke, you know, you know, Duke, North Carolina State, Wake Forest, and I was first re really recruited by a uh, Davidson College. I mean, Lefty Giselle was the first person to recruit me in the South. And he was the first person to offer me a scholarship. And um, I was really set uh, to go to Davidson, which at that time was an all-male school. Well, uh, when I was recruited by Carolina, the thing that really uh, 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 really got me excited by Carolina was that, and, 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 and Shimon, I think you understand this too, and I know you went through the same process. When you're recruited, Usually by other schools, when, when, when they have you up, they let you go out with guys who are maybe the All-Americans and the superstars, who when at that time you couldn't play as a freshman, when I came right. or when I got to that school, 
those guys I would not be playing with. Like when I visited to Syracuse, I went out with Dave Bing. But by the time I got about to go into Syracuse, Dave Bing would have graduated. Well, Coach Smith right. had, the, had the circumstances of having me go out with guys that I would be playing with. Dick Grubar, Joe Brown, who was on the freshman team at that time. And Larry Miller, who would be there when I played. And going out with those guys gave me a comfort zone to know the people that I would be playing with had accepted me as an individual and as a player already. So that part of the circumstances had been answered a lot for me. How will I be accepted by the guys I would be playing with? And to be honest right. with you, at the time that I uh, uh, was recruited by North Carolina, North Carolina was probably the fourth rated school in North Carolina behind Duke, Wake Forest, and Davidson. But that mm -hmm. freshman team of Rusty Clark, Joe Brown, uh, Bill Bunning, and Dick Grubard had, had, had the ingredients of a winning circumstance, and that was my intrigue and also coming. Now, the thing that really won me over for coming to Carolina was that I visited Carolina on a weekend that, that is called Jubilee Weekend, which you don't have anymore. And that was yes, the sir. weekend before finals. And on that weekend, you, it was like a big party, which Carolina at that time was the biggest party in school in the South. Right. So I, I visited Carolina on that weekend. And that weekend, they happened to have as guests, as, as performers, Smokey Robinson and the, and the Miracles and the <laughs> Temptation. So I said, any school that has Smokey Robinson and the Miracles and the Temptation, I really got to go to. And then no to top it off, and to top it off, the real, the bottom line for me coming to Carolina is that there was a school in Durham called Hillside High School that I had played against when I was in high school. And there was a girl there, and I'll never forget her name, was Dolly Smith, that sent me my first fan letter. And mm -hmm. when I got my first fan letter, and I knew that Chapel Hill was only eight miles from, uh, or 15 miles from Durham, I knew I had a good opportunity to go over to, you know, I had a girlfriend already waiting for me because she sent me a love letter. And then North Carolina Central was real close. So right. I wasn't too worried about, you know, mingling with, you know, ha having a good social atmosphere. So, I mean, all those things fit in. You know, I know, I know it doesn't sound, you know, dramatic or not, but when you are a 17 or 18 year old kid thinking about going to college, things like, girlfriends and, and things like, I mean, activities. And not only that, the teammates that you would be playing with, acceptance of you are very important. And all those things really were more important to me than Coach Smith, because those were the guys I was going to be with. And when, and when we started out, you know, Coach Smith uh, was the guy that, you know, uh, I didn't spend much time with Coach Smith. I spent most of my time with uh, Larry Brown and Coach Lotz, who were the assistants at that time. Right. So, you know, uh, and, and, and as you know how Coach Smith is, I mean, we were not in a democracy with Coach Smith. It was a dictatorship. He was the leader. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that's how things went about. It was a, not a democracy. So, you know, I mean, things were... I mean, we're just starting at that time, but uh, it was the situation of, of, of really the players that were there, you know, the coaching staff, and, and also it was the 60s. It was the time that some of us had to take on responsibilities, and I, was, I had the opportunity to do something that was going to be very uh, unique and very important in the civil rights era. And so it was, I mean, I had a responsibility and I had the opportunity to do it, and I felt like it was my obligation to fulfill that. Yes, sir. Sounds good. Well, a lot of us, a lot of us are very thankful for that decision, and uh, and 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 you having that the heroism to to make you know make the choice to to be that guy that uh, like you said before to take on the the leadership role in that regard, and uh, you know I'm I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful. Um, well, so, you know, you know, also Shimon, you know, I want to give credit to because he. I mean, I get a lot of credit for being the first black and, and all that because I went to the University of North Carolina because we were very successful. But you know, there was no retirement at Wake Forest at the same time. And there was Mike mm -hmm. Malloy at Davidson at the same time. And I want to give right. you guys some credence too because all of these things led into the state of North Carolina becoming the powerhouse in basketball that it had become. Uh, these guys mm -hmm. also were there at the same time I was in school. 
they also went through some of the same circumstances that I went through. And I want to, you know, say that, you know, they, they deserve as much credit as I get for they had to appear and go through the same circumstances that I went through. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's, that's great that you, you have, you know, the, the, you know, the, the understanding of, you know, there were other people within the state of North Carolina that were integrating other institutions as well. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you spoke about having to deal and go through some things. Uh, once you got to the University of North Carolina, got on campus and began to play and began to, you know, acquiesce yourself to that environment, uh, what, what were some of the things that you had to deal with uh, that, that, you know, that were bad, but also what were some of the things that, that you really enjoyed as well? Well, first of all, you got to understand one thing. I could not have a social life on the University of North Carolina campus. Okay. Because, because you got to understand one thing. The things that I wanted to do or that I was used to doing, no one else on that campus had been associated with that. They were all white. And I could right. not go where they were going. So really, besides basketball, there was isolation of a, a camaraderie because I couldn't go to the frat houses. And then, I mean, as much as Dickie and Joe and Rusty and all of them and Larry liked me, if I went with them, it would just ostracize them from the places that they were going to, you know? So there was choices that I had to make where I understood that I could not socially be involved with my teammates because the campus was not socially integrated at that time. The yes. basketball team was integrated, but not, but not the environment of the University of North Carolina. So, you know, uh, that's something that I, I, I dealt with. See, uh, Shaman, when you, when, when you go to college, you are able to make your friends. Your best friends are the guys you play with on the team. Right. Well, my best friends at that time could not be the guys I play with. We are now very close. But at the right. time we played, I could not go with, with, where Dick, Dickie Grubar was going, if he was going to the KA house or going with, or going with uh, Jim Delaney because they might have wanted me there, but the people that they were going with might have felt uncomfortable with me being there. So right. it wasn't of their doing or their choice, but the environment did not allow me to be a part of that. So, right. you know, isolation was something, you know, that I dealt with a whole lot. And, and, and to be honest with you, you know, the thing that prepared me for this was the fact that I had gone to school in New York at Stuyvesant High School which was 98% predominantly white. So I was prepared for this type of circumstance before because I had been in that environment before where I was the, uh, a, a minority and had to deal with the environment. But also I had the help of people like, you know, uh, like I said, uh, you know, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lee, you know, right. they were there and they were there as, as, as people to, you know, to help me, to help me in, in Chapel Hill. And, uh, and and Eva Caldwell were people that helped me during that time in Chapel Hill. So I mean, but no, I mean, but I understood the responsibility when I took it on. I did not go there except expecting to be welcomed with open arms and change the whole society with this one individual. I mean, uh, Coach Smith uh, uh, was very keen and aware of trying to make me feel like everyone else, but the circumstances did not did not really make it that way. I mean, he did all he right. could, and my teammates did all they could, but it still was the South in the 60s. And, and, and yeah. I had to deal with the circumstances there. But um, seeing guys like you and Phil Ford and James Worthy and Sam Perkins and all the other guys, you know, go there and not only go there, but be successful and enjoy it. And I have two kids that had graduated from the University of North Carolina. That's right. That's and right. to see their feelings about the school and what they have done in there, you know, make me, you know, make me proud to be a part of a circumstance that have turned out to be, and I still think is the uh, epitome of what college athletics should be about and how a school and, it, and its coaching staff and the family of basketball is so uh, intertwined, you know, and that we are still that close. That's important to me because Carolina has always been my family. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, I mean, we understand the things that you, you like you just said, you had to deal with uh, socially. Uh, how was the basketball? I mean, 
you know, you, you know, you one of the great, greatest guys to wear that uniform, man. So, you know, like you said, socially, you couldn't, you couldn't interact like you wanted to, but then when you got on the floor and you began to play, and I mean, people celebrated you and they loved the things that you could do. Uh, was there any kind of remorse or, you know, it, it kind of gave you more incentive to go out and, and dominate the game even more? You know, what, what, was, what was going through Mr. Scott's head at that time because of not being able to socially? Well, let yeah, me tell yeah. you one thing. I played basketball for three years at North Carolina and uh, right. had some great games. I mean, I mean, scored 40 points against Duke in the championship game, scored 32 against Davidson, hitting the last shot and all that. You know, yeah. through my three years of, of collegiate basketball, I never enjoyed one day because – if I didn't do well, it was going to be on me. Right. And when I did well, well, the team I already won before him, so it wasn't, so it wasn't because of him. Right. Because you got to remember, they had gone to the NCAA tournament the year before I, before I got there. That was the first time we had gone. So I was taking a guy named Bobby Lewis' place. So therefore, I could, own, I could only, the only thing I could do is keep doing what they did, which go to the final four. That's what they did when I was a freshman. So I right. never felt, I mean, after I scored 40 points against Duke in the final game, I went back to my hotel and ate a hamburger while everybody went out there and, and enjoyed it. Because to me, it was always just relief. It was never pleasure. It was never satisfaction because I couldn't do that. And I'll give you an example of it. Uh, like I said, uh, in the Eastern Region Finals, I scored 32 points and, and hit the last basket to beat Davis in the Eastern Region Finals. A New York Times reporter was following me around, and he went to this, he went to this uh, barber shop in, uh, in, in Durham, North Carolina, a white barber shop. And he asked the guys, what did they think about Charlie Scott? And he said, they said, Charlie Scott is the greatest thing out here. They all love Charlie Scott. The next week, we played Purdue in the um, semifinals of the NCAA tournament, we get beat by by about 15 or 16. You no, know, we lost Dick Gruba, our, our point guard had, had, had hurt his leg and didn't play that game. And so we lost by, by like oh, 10, 15 points. The reporter went back to that same barber shop and said, what do you think about Charlie Scott? And the answer then was that, you know how niggas choke under pressure. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm saying with the two sides that I always had. You know, mm -hmm. that's how they felt if you win, but if you lost, it was always on me. So to me, there was never a point of joy as there was always just a point of relief and satisfaction. So I didn't get to enjoy what I did. I look back on it now and I enjoy it. But at the time playing, and think about it, Shimon, how you would feel if you're the only one there and everyone's looking at you and you and the team the year before you went to the NCAA all the way to the final, first time ever, and now you took one guy place and they don't make it. Who do you think they're going to blame that on? Who is always going to be the one that's the difference from what they did last year? So like I said, it wasn't a point of pleasure to me as much as a point of relief at playing basketball all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is why it's extremely important for people to know who Mr. Scott is. And some of the things, you know, like it's a lot of people that, that celebrate you because you did wear the uniform, but nobody ever, you know, a lot of people don't get an opportunity to get the, you know, the the crux, crux of the whole situation. And, and and this is important for even uh, a lot of the student athletes instead of there now to understand the environment and, and be very appreciative of the environment that they have now. Because like I said before, I'm, I'm gonna keep saying it, uh, because of the choice that you made to go to University of North Carolina. Now, you know, having Coach Smith there, and knowing me knowing what he stood for and you know his statement to say hey you know what we 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 need a charlie scott um you you spoke about the environment but what were the some of the things that coach smith was trying to do to to maybe not get charlie scott to think about it or you know uh like you said before you were on the road and you won a championship game you had to go back to your room and and eat by yourself and those types of things. Uh, what were some of the things Coach Smith did to try to alleviate that pressure or make the environment just 
you know, better for Charlie because I'm 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 sure he understood, you know, some of the things, maybe not everything, but some of the things that you were having to endure. Well, you know, to be honest with you, I really believe that Coach Smith hit a lot of the uh, angst and things that I would have to do with, like letters, fan letters, hotels. I mean, Coach Smith probably shielded me from as much uh, acrimony as anyone possibly could. You know, you know, in Coach Smith, in other words, he always made the circumstance. I mean, only one time we went to, like, at the game for, you know, meal, and we were on the road in Columbia, South Carolina. And when we went in to eat, it was a place that Coach Smith had always eaten at. They would not allow, allow us to eat that time because I, was with, because I was a player on the team. So I know that after that time, Coach Smith made sure that those circumstances never happened again because I never, we never went in at a restaurant again where I was not accepted. And again, another time was when we played in Nashville. And, you know, after the game, it was a Friday game, and I had sat and we, and, and we had that, you know, the evening off. And I took a, a cab ride because we were on one side of town playing Banville, and I went to the other side of town, of course, where Fifth University and everything was. Right. So I could have a social life. And after 10 o'clock, when I wanted to get a cab to bring me back to the other side of town, no black cab would go to that side of town. I had to call Coach Smith at the hotel to come get me, to take me back to the other side of town in Nashville. And after that circumstance, Coach Smith made sure wherever we stayed, I, had, I, was, it was, it was, I was capable of being able to be in a surrounding where I felt comfortable, where I didn't have to go someplace else to feel comfortable and then could not get back to town, because you know how he is about being late and curfew right. and all those things. So, right. you know, so, so, you know, like I said, you know, you know, I mean, and, and again, he understood that where the other players go, I couldn't go. So I was going to always be in a different circumstance. So he made right. sure at that point in time that those things would not happen again. But again, for everyone, it was a learning process right. because it was in the South. It was the first time uh, Coach Smith tried. I mean, one thing Coach Smith did that was better than anything else is that Coach Smith didn't treat me any differently than he treated right. anybody else. Right. And I'll, and I'll give you an example. You, you know, like during Thanksgiving, you always have that break before Thanksgiving and you come back for practice. Right. Well, uh, you know, we had that break before Thanksgiving. And then when we came back for practice, again, I was over in. Durham, North Carolina. So I got to practice late. So uh -oh. when I got to practice late, Coach Smith <laughs> made me put on, the, you know, the vest, the vest. And, and, and the 25 pound vest and the shoes and run the steps. So beginning of practice, I'm just running the steps and I'm running the steps. And about 20 minutes into practice, I'm still running the steps and I'm running the right. steps. And then finally, I'm tired as hell. I mean, I'm still running the steps. So I go downstairs and I say, and I said, Coach, you know, um, can I stop running? He said, oh, Charles, I forgot about you. And I said, Coach, you didn't know that you didn't have the only dark spot on the court anymore? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know, Coach, this was colorblind, you know. I mean, he, he forgot I was running the stuff. And I said, you know, you didn't notice I was, you didn't notice you didn't have that one dark spot on the court anymore or anything? So, you know, Coach was, like I said, tried, you know, he tried as much as he could. And, 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 the first, and really, the first thing Coach Smith ever did when I was recruited there was take me to his church. And that was the first time I ever been in a white church in my life, you know, and, and it was strange that he took me to Olden Brinkley. I remember the church, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I mean, Coach Smith tried to make the environment as normal as possible, but you know, there was just so much he could do, you know, right. and you got to remember right. at that time, Coach Smith was a new coach. He hadn't firmly established himself within the uh, Carolina community and you know, he had just started. So therefore, you know, he did all the things that he could do. And, and like I said, you know, I have no qualms about 
my uh, uh, circumstance at Carolina. It was all, I mean, it was all, it was, it was nothing happened there that I didn't expect. And uh, are you there, Shaman? Yes, sir. I'm here. Okay, I would say, yeah, yeah, nothing, you know, nothing happened that I didn't expect to happen. And, 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 and basically, you know, it was like, you know, I thought it would be. See, when I went there and I met with the chancellor, the thing, the first thing he said to me was, Charles, what you're going to do will be for your children. And that turned out to be uh, really, a, 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 you know, a, a, a statement of truth. So, I mean, that's, I mean, that's what I mean, you know, because when I talk to my kids about Carolina, their eyes light up, then, they, I mean, they're part of the, they were part of the community. They love it. You know, they have, you know, they have, they have memories that, and they have circumstances. In fact, my son, Sean, is, is going to marry yeah. a, a Carolina a, a young lady. So, you know, I mean, like I said, you know, uh, I mean, my roots have been really uh, 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 sown and rooted in Carolina. And, and, and uh, I mean, I, I know everybody, you know, you're asking, was it tough? Yeah, you know, some things were tough, but see, I'm gonna give you the key also, Shaman, which really made things real great. You gotta realize that when I was in the University of North Carolina, there were about 20 black schools, colleges in North Carolina, you know, Shaw and all that. Yeah. And I was the only black male that all those black women knew all over the, all over the state. <laughs> so guess how I felt when every black woman in the state of North Carolina knew Charlie Scott. So, you know, life wasn't that damn bad after all, you know. But sometimes it's good being the only one, you know. It works out to y'all. <laughs> it was, you know, I was a young guy then, I, I was a and I was the face that every black parent want their daughter to marry. So I tried to be as sociable as I could be, as cordial as I could be at that time of my life, okay? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I understand. I understand. I know you would like that, wouldn't you? Now that's something everybody would like to be. <laughs> yeah. ah, that's a businessman talking right there. That's a businessman. Yeah. That's 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 Harlem, USA, right there, man. For sure. Hey, like I said, every black nope. woman in North Carolina you knew about Charlie Scott, and I loved every minute of it. <laughs> yeah, no. That's the only time I love being famous. <laughs> right now. Now, you know, we always talk about the athletic aspect of it, uh, Mr. Scott, and uh, the social aspect for sure is extremely important. Could you give us some perspective on how it was to go to class, like the academic perspective on being in class and, you know, you walk, in, <laughs> you walk into a class? And... Well, well, see, well, you got to say everything. I was valedictorian in high school. Okay. I was my valedictorian in high school, you know, you know I mean, uh, and like I said, I went to a, a school in New York City called Stuyvesant High School, which really, I mean, is the top, one of the top, uh, pro, I mean, top, uh, uh, I mean, top public high schools in the country, like maybe four or five in the country, you know, Stuyvesant High School. You take a test, you get in, 20,000 people take a test, and they only let in 800 a year. So, you right. know, I was prepared academically, you know, to a, a, a really uh, a deal with North Carolina. But, you know, when you the, uh, first black guy in the class, you no know, question. I mean, you still have apprehension about doing things. And I'm going to okay. give you an example. You know, like I was always good in, in, in math. I got like a 790 on my SAT in math. So I took calculus, you know, while I was in Carolina, my first year in Carolina. And so I you remember, too. you know, sitting in class, but being the only black guy in class and everything, and you know how you, you know, they give you, the, you know, problems and doing, but who's going to come up to the board and do it and do it? And, you know, I would never raise my hand because I did not want to make my, you know, that's all I thought of. That's all these folks had to see is this first black guy go up there and make a fool of himself. So I never would raise my hand in calculus. But one day, a uh, guy sitting next to me, he raised his hand and he went up and did, a, did, a, did, a, did, a, did a, you know, the, the equation and everything. And when he right. got through, I looked at it and said, I couldn't be, look any stupider than he looked with the answer he put up on that board. <laughs> so at that point, I realized, hey, I'm not the dumbest guy in this because I ain't got to worry about that. So after that point in time, I wasn't afraid to go up there and answer the question. But I said, I know that the guy in this class is dumber than me because I just saw him go up on that board and put an answer up there. 
So, you know, well, I got an A in calculus. Anyway. I was good, but I'm just saying, those type of things, you know, like you said, when you're in class, you don't, I mean, when you're the only one there, you don't want to, because I'm, I'm the one that they're going to judge how every other black person is going to do things. So, I mean, like I said, even though I knew I was great in math, I wasn't going to do that until I saw somebody do something that I thought was so stupid that I couldn't look any dumber than he looked on that answer. So after that, it gave me that feeling. And, and then also, I was the type of person, because I went to Lomberg, I had learned study hours where like at Lomberg, we had two hours a night from seven to nine, you had to stay in your room and study. So I had a good habit of studying hours. And so, and you know, like at Carolina, you usually take, three classes was, you know, you went six days, three classes on one day and two classes on the other day. So you, you had to be through by one o'clock because practice always started at three, you know? So I always, so I always had, you know, I understood, I would take my classes in the morning and then I would study after I got out of my classes. And I would study for two hours. And I always felt like if I didn't get it in two hours, I would never get it. Right. I would study Mondays to Thursdays, but I never study on the weekend, but I always put that time in to study and everything, you know? So, I mean, it, I mean, it was always like that. I mean, I mean, so I was always, you know, prepared for that. And, and, another, and another thing is that being a competitor, like I said, I was valedictorian in high school. Yes, sir. I, I always competed for grades also. Now, I'm going to tell you a story, and this is a bad story. And this is a bad story about Carolina. And Carolina people don't want to hear this, you know, because, you know, it was one time that I was in a class with the other guys on the team, uh, Rusty right. Clark. Well, no, it was Rusty, it was Dick Grubar and Joe Brown. I think it was a history class we were taking. No, it was some class. And the thing about it was that who's on this line? <laughs> we had. Well, we were able to be in the same class and you know rusty was really the best the best student so we all wanted to stay around rusty and then we had this one class and i was i wasn't sure i was gonna do real well but i knew if i stayed around rusty if i needed a little help i could i could i could edge him a little bit so we right. all sat down in the classroom and we were getting ready to take the test and then the teacher said Everybody from A to G get up and go to the other classroom. So that was Joe Brown, Dick Grubar, and Rusty Clark. Everybody else stay here. So I said, I got to find a way to go with Rusty and them. So I got up and started walking. And the teacher said, Scott, I said, A to G go in the other classroom and everybody else stay here. And I said, yes, but Coach Smith told me to stay with the ball players. <laughs> so I got to go with Rusty in there. <laughs> and the teacher let me go. So hey, sometimes things work out good being teammates with somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Quick on your feet, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Coach Smith on that one. He told us to stay together as a team. And she used to love that one. She loved me saying that. Yeah. Stay together, baby. They, they thought you were only quick on your feet on the court. Oh, no. I'm quick on my feet yeah. everywhere. No, nah, but, I mean, but, but seriously, you know, like I said, academically, I, I mean, like, I was always for that. I, I mean, and, 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 and and I'm proud to say, you know, not, I mean, I was also an academic All-American because, I mean, I do, I mean, I, I mean, I believe in competing on both sides. And think about it, and you know that Coach Smith is going to make you do your work, you know. And, no question. You know, and, nope. you know, like, you know, because his thing was always, and especially when we were playing, we weren't thinking about being professional basketball players. We were right. thinking about what we going to do in our life. 90% of the, now, I'm the only one from the four years that I played that went to professional basketball. So Coach right. Smith was not making professional basketball his agenda to how he, how he uh, grow or uh, groom his players. He groomed right. them to be ready for life and to be able to be, to be successful in life. And, and, and those were the things that I really picked up a whole lot on. Yes, sir. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. How, how was things for you, Mr. Scott? You know, like you said, you had a great career there at the University of North Carolina. Then you went on, like you said, to be one. 
<laughs> to one of the very few at that time to go on and play professional basketball. And so, so how was that for you, um, you know, knowing what you had endured, what you had stood for, what you had accomplished at uh, the University of North Carolina, and then going on into to having a professional career? Well, I mean, and, I mean, uh, I can say this now because I can't play with the damn anymore. So everybody could be, be playing right now, so I ain't worried about this. <laughs> but to be honest with you, uh, after coming out of Carolina, really basketball was really – very simplistic to me from an ideology standpoint. Coach Smith right. taught me how to think the game, how to play right. the game, and how to take advantage of things. I'll give you an example. Right. I'll give you an example. Like you said, I always knew I was fast and, and speed. So, you know, I would always use my speed. And then one time Coach Smith said to me, you know what, why are you trying to use the speed on a guy who's 5'10"? Why don't you use your post up so you get you to think about how to do things? He taught me how to take advantage of certain things. He taught me how to make the game easier for myself. So, like I said, when I got into the pros, you know, I was prepared to play a professional game from what we had going through in Carolina. Because the thing that you learn in Carolina is how to play with other good players. That's what is the unique part about going from college to, to professional basketball. Most players in college, when you're the star, everything comes to you. Now, when you get to the pros, the other four guys on the court were the same thing. Now, how right. do you learn to play with other good ball players? How do you learn to respect other guys' basketball ability and what they do well? You know, right. and, and, and that's a thing that Coach Smith taught us how to play together. And, right. and, and, and not only that, how to understand to give the ball to the guys where they're in their position. So, so he taught us how to be thinking basketball players. Because I remember, I don't know how long he did it, but he used to have quarterback meetings with the quarterbacks of the teams, of mm -hmm. the team, Duke Grew Out, before the game, to go over game plans. What do you do if this happens? What do you do if this happens? So you're prepared for anything. Like you said, Coach Smith tried to prepare you for any circumstance that ever happened. If there are three seconds right. left, we had a three seconds left circumstance where we knew to throw the ball a half court and call timeout again. You know, he had every right. he provided propels for every circumstance. And that carried me over in, into professional basketball, where really professional basketball was a lot easier because Easy. of the fact that I, I had already been taught the circumstances of how to play within the confines of other good ball players. And also, you know, the best thing that happened to me was that when I played in the ABA my first year, you know, I played with another backcourt player named Fatty Taylor. So, you know, he was good, and he'll always tell you that he and I together in the backcourt averaged 40 points a game. Right. I averaged 34, and he averaged six. But we were complimentary <laughs> to Jimmy each other. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We <laughs> <laughs> well, no, what I'm saying, I'm just kidding about that, but it's the truth of the ad. But I'm just saying the idea is that Coach Smith, I was prepared from college to go to pro basketball because of the way we played, the system in which we played in, and the style in which we played prepare you to be able to play any type of basketball. And that's what professional basketball was all about. So, I mean, right. that's why, I mean, you see Coach Smith's players – are very, I mean, very efficient and feel very comfortable in professional basketball because the fundamentals, the idea of how to play with other people together, I mean, I mean, really, what, what, I mean, is what he really, really, really taught us. And, and those things really went farther for me to play when I played in the NBA. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so, so now, you know, I want to go to this reflecting part. Of, of my you know of this podcast and uh because of some of the things that you did and uh you know like i said before you being a courageous individual that you are you know you look back now and like we were talking earlier you know like sean going to the university of north carolina and your daughter going to the university of north carolina you know what how did that feel as a you know as a you know it's great as a father but knowing the steps that you had taken for the opportunity to present itself 
uh, like you re referenced earlier, the chancellor saying, hey, you know, you know, your children having an opportunity to go here and things like that. How, how did that make you feel? Well, you know, I got a statement that I use and I tell my wife this all the time. No matter, you know, and, and we all have adversity. Yes, sir. We all deal. I mean, we're all going to have adversity. You're going to deal with adversity. But I tell my wife this and I tell my kid this. I think I live my best life. Mm -hmm. And that's what I feel. You know, mm -hmm. the things that I went through, everything that I, I mean, the enjoyment. I, I mean, I, I feel like I've lived my best life because, I mean, the things that I did are good. But what I enjoy more about it is the relationship that Carolina has given me an opportunity to have a family outside of my family and has given me the opportunity to feel, you know, to feel enjoyed and, 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 and to feel like you are part of something that is just bigger than yourself. You know, uh, being part yeah. of Carolina basketball really gives me a, a feeling of, of, of something that's very important. Be it character, be it, you know, be, I mean, be it, you know, personality. I mean, I mean, when, when somebody tells me they went to Carolina, I expect a certain type of person. And if right. I didn't see that that's type right. of person, I think something is wrong. So, I mean, that's, right. that's what Carolina has given me, a perspective that when I, when, when, when I see a person that said they are Tar Heel, we have a bond that will never be broken. Broken, that's right. Message. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I can, I can, I can, re uh, you know, I can say that resonates with me because like here where I am in South Carolina, I mean, even last night, um, you know, there's a gentleman driving down the road to the left of me in a truck and I look at his tag and it has, it has a UNC insignia on it. So I pull up beside him and I put my arm out the window and he looks, <laughs> and then I, I say, roll the window down. He rolls the window down and I say, I like your tag. I say, I'm a 1998 graduate, Shimon Williams. He said, oh yeah, yeah, I know who you are. And then he introduces himself, Doug Furman, graduate, University of North Carolina, 1997. So we pull over, we exchange information. And so even here in the, you know, in the state of South Carolina, where there's not many of us, I, I hold that same regard as you say, because uh, there's like 50 of us now that I've pulled over. Yeah. <laughs> like well, you said, I mean, and, you know, and, and to be honest it's, with you, Coach, Smile, Coach Smith started this type of circumstance. I mean, that's right. not just being the University of North Carolina, Coach Smith put together a character, a personality of the University of North Carolina and the people that he recruited and that went there that gave us a feeling of unity and, 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 and right. a feeling that anyone that has gone there know that their brethren or brethren are anybody that's a Tar Heel. And, and, and that's something that Coach Smith had, made, had given to Carolina that it, it has tried to keep it up and and Roy is keeping that same tradition, and we hope that the people of Carolina and the alumni of Carolina have kept the same tradition, and, and, and that's what I think makes us special. You yes. Know, I mean, I, I've been a lot of places and seen a lot of, a lot of things, and i I never forget one year we went out and we had a, a, a game out at, I think it was back in 82, 84, back out in UCLA, a, a, a UCLA alumni against a Carolina alumni, and I remember, and I got a lot of friends that played for UCLA that came up to me and said, dog, you guys, y'all still talk to each other. Y'all real close. And I said, hey, we family. You know, we don't we're use family. the word just to say it. We're family. I said, that's right. and, I said and anybody that said they're Tar Hill, and I say I'm a Tar Hill, we're family. And, and, family. and they just could not understand that. And I'm talking about the guys who played during the wooden eras, which is supposed to have been the dynasty of basketball. Right. They might have been the dynasty of the court, but the dynasty of tradition, tradition, I think, still holds with Carolina. Man, that's, that's powerful there. That. that is powerful. That's powerful. That's powerful. Boy, woo! That's, <laughs> woo! That puts chills in my body right there. Well, in, in 2018, Mr. Scott, if you can go back to 2018, something very remarkable happened. 
uh, that many don't get a chance to do. And uh, I think it was noteworthy. Um, and I think it was, it was well, well received. And I think most people uh, are extremely happy that it happened. Can you remember anything happening in 2018? Oh, I mean, I made the Hall of Fame. I mean, there you that, go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, but you know what, though? See, I mean, and, and, and to be honest, to be honest with you, you know, and again, this comes from uh, just being around, I mean, Coach Smith. I mean, the biggest thrill I have about basketball was playing with the guys. It wasn't right. a reward, it wasn't the awards or things right. like that. Sure. Now, 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 Hall of Fame to me is a great thing because it solidifies my part in basketball. But to me, it solidifies what Larry Brown and John Lodge and Bill Guthridge and Coach Smith put into me, like I said, right. prepare me to be the type of ball player that I, that I, that I became. I mean, uh, you know, Coach Smith took a rough diamond and cut it and made it, you know, you know, you know, 24 carat. You know, I, right. I, 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 give, I give him, I mean, I, I give him all the credit. And, and, and again, you know, making the Hall of Fame is a great thrill. The only thing about it was that Coach Smith wasn't there because he, it would have meant more to him than it meant to me. Coach Smith worried more about what we received than what he received. And so, I mean, yeah. that's the only bittersweet part about it is that, that he himself was not there to see it, but I mean, to make the Hall of Fame, you know, to, to be able to do that, you know, I mean, means a great deal to me. Of course, it's an accomplishment that every basketball player, every athlete want to be, to be, to be recognized, you know, in the sport that you play as, you know, one of the best ever played it. But I mean, one thing that I learned from Carolina, you know, I mean, the only thing I ever wanted from basketball is the respect of the other basketball players. That's right. You know, that's right. That's what I played basketball for. That's right. The respect of the basketball players. So, you know, knowing that I had that, that was really a, a satisfactory within myself. But no the question. Hall of Fame just uh, uh, solidified the circumstances where, you know, that it, it, that, 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 that it made it, you know, legitimate all the way around. So, I mean, I mean, that's how I feel. But, I mean, I feel great. You got somebody over there that you want to talk to? No, I'm, 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 I, don't, I don't do this often, but I think it's extremely important for, for myself and for my family. Um, I just told my son to go get my daughter um, because I want them to have a chance to meet you. Oh, okay. And That's fine. It, uh, come in. Come in. I want you to meet somebody. One of you stand on this side. On you stand on this side. This is Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott, because of what Mr. Scott chose to do, Daddy had a chance to go to University of North Carolina. And I want you guys to look at this man and please tell him thank you. Thank you. All right. Hey, yeah. hey you know what, though? But see, y'all thanking me, but I might have started it, but your dad had to keep it going. See, nothing <laughs> is good unless, it, unless there's a continuation of it. And so yeah. all of you, and now you guys, you see that, see them jerseys behind y'all? That, that North Carolina means a whole lot. That means a whole yeah. lot. So y'all are Tar Heel. So y'all got a big responsibility on your hand when you say you're Tar Heel. That doesn't yeah, no come question. to you. No question. Tar Heels right. mean that, that, that you're leaders. Hi. Yes, sir. Okay then, Shaman. Well, Mr. Scott, yeah, this is going to conclude it, man. But I, I, I have to say this, uh, as always, finish when I especially get to talk to someone of your magnitude you guys you know you guys laid the path for us and um, you know a lot of times guys don't get to say how appreciative they are and um, you know every every African-American athlete that's played at the University of North Carolina uh, owes you kudos but more importantly uh, you know a lot of times people don't get the flowers that they deserve and um, I want you to know that um, my family is extremely appreciative. Um, my community is extremely appreciative um, of the sacrifice and what you did. Because without 
your steps, like you said, a lot of times people will be apprehensive on doing things. And because of what you did, it's allowed me to do things for my family that I never thought I'd be able to do, uh, be able to help others that I never thought that I'd be able to do. And uh, it's because of you, man. And uh, Well, let me know, tell you something. Love you. Because we love you and we appreciate you. <laughs> Let me tell you, I live in Atlanta. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. And yes, I just sir. put out my post. See, just like you thank me, I thank guys like John Lewis. Because no people like that right now, we're getting ready to see Kamala Harris become the vice president of the United States, a black woman. So, yes, you sir. know, these little steps that I made and that you helped make and that you solidified, because again, people like you and people that came after me are the reason that Carolina is the school that it is today. And it's the reason that Carolina is the state that it is today because it wasn't that type of state when I was in it. So you people and all Carolina people, wherever they go all over the country, they learn to become a part of that community, but also to teach that community that there is an appreciation for everybody being together. That's what Coach Smith was all about. That's, that's what right. he taught us. And wherever you go, that's your responsibility to bring that same type of cognizant and awareness to whatever you're involved in. And uh, thanks a lot. I really yep. appreciate it. Yep. Well, we appreciate you coming on, Mr. Scott. You don't know how powerful this was. Uh, I think I think everybody that uh, that subscribes to the Carolina podcast uh, conversation, I think they're going to really enjoy this, man. I mean, you, you brought a lot of things, so awareness, but you gave us a lot of insight. And, uh, you know, it's not often you get a chance to talk with someone of your magnitude, man. So I most definitely want to say thank you. Uh, the Field of 68 Media Network wants to say thank you as well. And, uh, man, you know, is there any, anything that I can do to help, man, and God permit to get an opportunity to come down to Atlanta and, and just spend some time with you, go out to eat or something. Yeah, you know? whatever you come down, yeah. You can definitely yeah. do that. Okay. Well, we appreciate you. And uh, tell your wife you said hello. And uh, and I talk to Sean all the time. So, hey, okay. Man. Hey, man. Okay. So, all right. See you later then, Sean. Okay. You be easy. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.